It's a pleasure to have you at the podcast. Six, seven years ago, we were discussing your PhD thesis about uh, the blasphemy in Islam. It's a very important topic. Blasphemy as a concept is a crucial topic, not only in Islam, but in other, other religions. Can you summarize uh, your PhD thesis and uh, what you considered as a blasphemy in Islam or what Islamic authorities, sheikhs and, and great uh, thinkers and uh, theologians uh, defined as a blasphemy? Because we have different interpretations, different schools of Islam and different uh, different uh, theologians and sheikhs. Please go ahead. Right. Right. No, absolutely. So as you, yes. So in my dissertation, what I look at is I actually look at this concept of sabda rasul, which is insulting the prophet. And so different jurists and different theologians actually defined it a little bit differently. Um, but generally speaking, the definition that they would come to is demeaning the prophet either by attributing to him um, qualities that are viewed as reprehensible or basically not positive, as well as anything um, attributing this idea that he could be lying or that what he's saying is untrue, right? And so that's the idea that they kind of ended up, generally speaking, agreeing on. Um, the specifics, they would disagree on a little bit. And so with my dissertation, actually, I I was initially, or I, the, the, the work that um, that led to my dissertation actually was when I was I was working at the State Department for before my PhD. And during that time, we were actually looking at some of the legal codes in the Muslim world and I was also looking at these dis uh, discussions on defamation of religion, uh, on the defamation of religions resolution at the United Nations. And this, you know, this conversation constantly kept coming up of, okay, well, you know, is first of all, what is blasphemy or what is Sabah Rasul specifically in an Islamic context? And are the definitions that are being offered by the OIC or the Muslim, you know, specific Muslim countries, is that actually more reflective of modern geopolitics or is that actually historically how Islamic law has defined it in, pre, in the pre-modern context? Um, and with that specifically, they were dealing with this issue of um, in the in the, in the UN and human rights discourse, there's this issue of you know insulting a person versus insulting ideas, or rather insulting harming a specific person versus discussing or dealing with ideas, right? And so that's where a lot of this confusion was coming in. And then later, actually, when I visited Jordan in a completely separate context, I was studying under a Hanafi judge in Jordan, and he actually was. Um, Oftentimes what jurists do is, you know, they they are, they often have two or three um, professions that they're engaging in at the same time. They may be engaging in producing scholarship while at the same time functioning as a judge. And this is largely what he was doing. And he was actually editing a manuscript by Ibn Abdin, who is a 19th century Hanafi jurist from the Levant. And he was telling me about it. And he's telling me, you know, what's very interesting about this manuscript is how, you know, on the one hand, Ibn Abdin is considered one of the most prominent Hanafi um, authorities, like in the Hanafi school period, like no one would disagree with that. On the other hand, his view is very different from what you see in a lot of modern Islamic criminal codes and civil codes in the Muslim world. And ironically, in some cases, like in with the case of Pakistan, for example, they'll actually cite him for their as their precedent, as their support for their code for, for their laws on Sabah Rasul, in, in which they basically make execution as the mandatory penalty for committing blasphemy against the Prophet. But ironically, he actually, Ibn Abidin actually argues the opposite. <laughs> and so that was a very curious puzzle to me that why would you have laws on blasphemy mandating and requiring execution for this act, but then you're essentially kind of miss attributing it to medieval jurists who are arguing the opposite. Um, and so that's what kind of led to my exploration. And he, both he and my advisor actually encouraged me to explore this and look at it in the Hanafi school and also look at it across across the juridical schools. And in summary, and we can go into more detail as we discuss, but um, by and large on, on two levels, just you know, to discuss this on two levels. The first is from a textual interpretive perspective, 
um, Ibn Abidin was not the only one to discourage such type of penalties for blasphemy. By and large, jurists would try to reduce um, or disassociate corporal or capital punishments with certain types of crimes. And with the Hanafis in particular, they would argue that, look, we don't have anything specific in the Quran that actually states that you have to execute someone for this. If anything, this is just something between, if it's a private act committed, then it's something between God and that person. You know, it's their, it's their, it's their belief. It's, 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 it's their, it's, it's, it's their process that they're going through. And that's between them and God. If it's causing some type of incitement to violence in public, then that's a different thing. That's dealt with differently. But the Hanafis, by and large, even textually, did not view blasphemy as something that ought to be dealt with um, corporally. And or at the very least with execution in most cases. And then secondarily, when we actually look at cases and when we actually look at instances in which this was brought to courts, by and large, it was something that was thrown out or not taken seriously, um, except in certain circumstances, because again, they viewed this as something that is like, okay, this is between you and God. Oftentimes it's, our, it's also an issue of an area of law that is kind of co-opted by the state for the purposes of state you know, control over specific populations. And so that's where jurists often played this role of trying to avoid the state having such powers over executing individuals. And so you have texts that actually mention this, that, oh, so-and-so was arrested for blasphemy, but he was let go, or it was never followed through with, those kinds of things. Um, and so with my dissertation, I examined this, and we can go into more specifics about which each, you know, what each of these jurists said. But what's particularly problematic about the modern discourse is that, um, you know, the what's being what's inspiring the modern discourse is, or at least what the the, the pre-modern view that aligns with what you see in the modern discourse of this association between execution and blasphemy is largely the texts and views of Ibn Taymiyyah. And Ibn Taymiyyah, um, in his time at least, you know, he'd be closest to the Hanbali school, but he wasn't quite Hanbali either. Um, and a number of mainstream jurists actually criticize him and critique him for the view that he takes and says that this is not actually um, a reflection of orthodox Islamic legal interpretation. Um, but his view has largely been kind of unequivocally adopted in modern contexts. And that's why you see this statement over and over again of, well, this is what Islam says. Islam says if, you know, if someone burns the Quran or if someone insults the prophet, then we have to execute them. Yeah, so we're talking about the uh, Hanbali school mm -hmm. established by Ibn Hanbal and uh, right. continued with uh, Ibn Taymiyyah as a, as a prominent scholar and... Uh, and safe. Yeah, the interesting thing, Saib, is he was not actually viewed even by the Hanbalis as representative of their school during his time and the couple centuries afterwards. And by that, you know, I know a lot of people will take me, will, 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 will have a problem with what I say, but this is historically the truth, is that, you know, he is considered a prominent theologian. He had very important works. But the fact is, is even, you know, the, the, the three centuries, the, the century within which he lived, and then the two centuries afterwards, all, the majority of jurists in the Orthodox Madahib had a problem with citing him and had a problem seeing him as, as an authority. And we see this particularly in the two centuries after him in the Ottoman, you know, once the Ottomans start taking over the Levant, we see these discussions, particularly amongst Hanafi and Shafi jurists, who say that, no, Ibn Taymiyyah, we don't consider him authoritative enough to actually cite him. Um, and they actually distance themselves from him. And, you know, what we see now in the modern period is that he's cited everywhere. <laughs> True. I mean, traditionalist uh, Islam uses the corpus of uh, juridical texts that have been yes. written by, by expert uh, jurists. Right, is, right. Please, and... please go ahead. You can, you can better explain oh, sure. uh, the process than me. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so what we find is in that there are actually it's it's so interesting. Sorry, because you know one of my professors actually once told me that you know the majority of the Islamic historical tradition that has been recorded in manuscript form, maybe only eight or nine percent of it has actually ever been edited into modern books and edited into like publishable, readable books. Right. So the majority of our tradition is actually not even something that is. That, that typical person would even have access to, unfortunately, and that's something that needs to change. But with um, with Islamic law, what you find is, you know, you have 
it's 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 very similar to other legal systems like American law, for example, where you know you have these initial evidentiary sources, you have these sources, these original sources that are considered to be kind of the prime focus within, you know, on which you focus your interpretation, right? You have the Quran, you have the Hadith, and then you have certain legal tools such as what's called Qiyas, legal analogy, where you, you know, if you don't, if you're dealing with an unprecedented issue, then you look to the original sources, you look to the Quran, you look to the Hadith, you look to other um, related sources, and you kind of try to extrapolate and analogize, right? And then you have ijma, which is consensus. That's another one where if jurists um, um, in a specific time period all agree, um, and ijma is a very complicated concept, so I'm giving you, like, you know, this, I don't, this is a very, very generalized idea of it, but if you, the jurists agree on a specific view, then we take that as authoritative as well. Um, then that can also be viewed as a that, that's usually that's also viewed as a source of precedent and so over time what would happen is jurists would write about specific topics they would write about um made you know specific issues in islamic law as discussed in the quran as discussed in the hadith and then specific interpretive approaches would kind of coalesce around specific thinkers and so we have abu hanifa um all of you know and all of these all the 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 the, the kind of the 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 madahib largely coalesced within the first few centuries after Islam, right? So you have Abu Hanifa, you have Imam Shafi'i, you have Imam Malik, and you have Ibn Hanbal, right? And so there are specific differences in their interpretive approaches, but the approaches are usually not terribly, terribly different from each other. It just depends on the issue and it depends on what's at stake. Um, and over time, jurists would essentially, you know, Legal schools kind of functioned as guilds where, you know, over time, as these specific schools became canonized, um, jurists in the next centuries would then essentially kind of opt to, to uh, decide to train or learn within a specific madhab, and they would adopt that legal approach and they would continue building on it. They would continue writing texts inspired by their predecessors, while at the same time adding explanation, adding exegesis, adding, you know, question and answer, what we call fatawa, um, yeah. to the corpus, you know? Um, and so that's why, you know, so we find this legacy from Abu Hanifa all the way, with the Hanafi school particularly, all the way to Ibn Abdin. And what's very interesting is, if we take the Hanafi school specifically, you look at Abu Hanifa's writings on sub, for example, and he takes a very, very, very minimalist approach. He basically, you know, first he he discusses these are all the classes of these are all the groups of individuals that cannot even be held responsible for it in terms of its relationship, in terms of being executed for it. And in that he includes anyone who cannot be considered a combatant. So children, slaves, women. And sometimes people look at this and they think, is this is this a you know, is this a gender biased approach to fifth? Yeah. Is this something he was he being, yeah, was he being, you know, was he being misogynist? And I explained that look, <laughs> the medieval period, generally speaking, was a very gendered society. But it this was. is one example, you know, and it was, right? And but that's because that's how the that, that's the way the economy, like everything is interrelated at the end, that's the way the economy functioned and human labor functioned, right? But with Abu Hanifa, in this case specifically, it's not, he's not being misogynist, he's not being gendered. What he's doing is he's trying to, in any way possible, exclude as many groups as he can from being subject to the specific penalty. And then finally, he says that, look, the fact is, is that you cannot, and actually the most significant one is he excludes non-Muslims from being penalized. And he says that, look, the fact is, is, you know, insulting the prophet relies, you know, for this to be, you know, it, for this to be something that's, that can be criminalized or to be pe penalized for it, you have to, like, this is a crime of belief. So if yeah. someone doesn't even believe in Islam, how do you, he's like, you can't. You, you can't, can't expect from him that, uh, exactly, he, he's not going to follow. He yeah, he doesn't follow in the first place. Exactly. He yeah. doesn't follow in the first place. And as he said, he's committing what, what's called shirk. He's already believing in a different God. Why would you hold him responsible for what he says, what he says about the prophet? He already doesn't believe, about, you know, he already doesn't believe in the prophet. So that was a very big exclusionary category that a lot of people don't realize because in the modern context, you see people back and forth accusing you know, non-Muslims of committing sabbat rasul and saying they should be executed for it. So that was a big exclusionary category. He said non-Muslims cannot be penalized for this, um, not with execution at least. And he also says women can't be, and his rationale was that, well, because they're not traditionally combatants. And so when you look at his conversation, what he basically demonstrates, what he, his conception 
of this is that it's more if it's committed as an act of treason, you know, because yeah. as we know, in the pre-modern period, you know, religious affiliation was very much corresponding with political affiliation. Absolutely. So, it was so important in pre-modern, yeah. pre-political times, namely before the end yeah. of 18th century, religious affiliation was the most important thing in, in the society. Recently, Absolutely. I had a conversation, not recently, maybe a year or, or a year and a half ago, I had a conversation with a historian specialized in uh, medieval history, and he's been making some wrong analogies by equating modern society and, and interconfessional relations in 21st century with interconfessional relations in 12th or 11th century. This is totally yeah. wrong. And, uh, even confessions lived in different parts of the city. They they had special quarters and and they were segregated uh, in that time. If someone publicly professed atheism or or agnosticism, he would be ostracized immediately. So it's right. comparable to what we have in 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 last two two hundred two hundred fifty years. So go ahead. I was interrupting you. Yeah. No. 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 I, I I appreciate that you that you that you pointed that out because I think that's something that a lot of um, a lot of individuals out there don't realize is that you know yes. the nation state was only the nation state is a modern construct. Exactly. This, the, this idea that we have a political identity separate from a religious or ethnic identity is a very very modern concept, and in pre modern in pre modern society that just didn't exist. And so for Abu Hanifa, he basically largely when you look at his different fic sections when you look at his 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 discussion on treason and on rebellion it very much reflects his discussion on sabr rasul where he basically argues that look if you commit this act but you do it in a way that's public and you do it in a way that's threatening and it's really clear that you're basically part of inciting mass violence then that's one thing then you then you then you're dealt with because you're dealing because you're because you're involved in mass inciting mass violence right but otherwise he very, 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 very much minimized any type of um, significant penalty for this. Why? Because in the Hanafi school, they basically argued that for something to be dealt a significant corporal penalty or capital punishment, we have to have a very clear Quranic statement commanding us to do it. Yeah. And his rationale was there's nothing in the Quran that tells us to do this. So we cannot. We're basically putting blood on our hands by executing people who exactly. God never told us to do. And so this this view continues on up until right before the Ottoman period. And what's very interesting is even the Hanafis develop a very specific framework on um, the idea of the Dhimma contract as well. Like what you were just mentioning, this issue of um, different, you know, different religious groups living under a specific rule, right? And so denominations. Hanafis, we had many denominations. Yep. yep. And so they specifically in relation, and I'm mentioning this because it's related. Um and I have to say the other madhab, the other madhabs don't agree with the Hanafis on this, but the Hanafis basically say, look, we have this idea of Ahda Dhimma, um, contract of protection of other um groups who come from other religious traditions. And essentially we cannot, you know, as so long as they don't rebel, they have no obligation to adhere to the same laws that Muslims do. They don't, and this is this was their this was this was also connected to this premise of this idea. Well, they don't believe in the Prophet. They don't believe in 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 our version of the Shahada. They don't believe in our version of what you know of of of, of Tawheed and God and all these things. And so we're not going to hold them responsible. Therefore, than for all the other rights and practices of Islam. And so long as they don't rebel, then they're left to do what they want to do. And so it, this changes only with the advent of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, basically, what ends up happening is they they have a very different view on how um, juridical schools should function under their empire. Previously, while Muslim empires would adopt a school, they left the interpretive aspect of it to the jurists as a private enterprise. There wasn't as much active control over what jurists were actually producing. With the Ottoman Empire, they basically decide, no, we are going to, similar to what the Mongols are doing, we are going to not only adopt a school, we're going to control 
the education and well, at least one strand of scholars who become educated in that school and and also influence their interpretation of how they approach specific legal doctrine. And so they basically introduce a new thread, so to speak, a new genealogy of scholars who are now considered Hanafi, but they're not Hanafi in the traditional sense. They're not being trained in the traditional circles and the private juridical kind of uh, spaces that Hanafis are normally trained in. They're now being trained in Ottoman-sponsored schools. And the Ottomans are basically using that strain of the Hanafi school to then kind of basically have a juridical authority that will endorse their state policies. And so this is where we see Sabah Rasul and the Hanafi schools particularly completely transform and change. Um, essentially, the Ottomans and the Safavids, as you know, for two to three centuries, engage in quite a bit of conflict. And the Safavids are Shi'i, and yeah. they, they they end up, you know, they, the Ottomans view them very much as a threat. And so what the Ottomans do is they look upon Ibn Taymiyyah's interpretations, as well as a couple of Hanafis who adopt his views. And to be clear, Ibn Taymiyyah's view was that anyone who commits any form of Sabah Rasul is subject to execution, no ifs, ands, or buts. And yeah, so he was pretty Ottomans harsh. Views, he Actually, was quite his, harsh. His, his te teaching was uh, very harsh, or considered harsh by other theologians. And unfortunately, a lot of non-Muslims and people who didn't study Islamic theology like yourself think that uh, every crime committed uh, under Sharia law is punishable by that. They, they think right. everything that people are uh, are doing, misbehaving, they, they should be executed immediately, like it's some kind of... Uh, right. Of, right. Which exactly. is not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. And it's actually a minority view. Ibn Taymiyyah was not... And I'll well, remind me, I'll actually go back to Ibn Taymiyyah and explain the context within which he even developed his view, because his view was not accepted by by yeah, by the, the by, uh, by the structures. The yeah, exactly. In the Mamluk period, he was very much viewed as an outsider. But basically, what happens with the Ottomans is they um, they adopt his view as it's trans, you know, as it as it becomes absorbed by a few early Hanafis. Um, and then their strain of Hanafi jurists, they're basically the state appointed Hanafi jurists, not the other Hanafis, the state appointed Hanafi juries, jurists adopt his view and expand on it. And what we find later is Ibn Abdin, a 19th century judge, he basically looks back and he says, this is not the authentic norm and tradition of our school. And he's the one that very interestingly functions as a jumps in as, you know, instead of functioning as a normative jurist, kind of jumps in and does a little bit of history here. And he says, look, this is not what the Hanafis did. The Hanafis actually yeah. avoided execution in all cases to the degree that they could. And it was only when Ibn Taymiyyah's view was absorbed by early Ottomans that we find the status quo in the during the Ottoman period of Hanafis or commanding the execution execution for Sabah Rasul. And this was largely motivated by this conflict with the Safavids, where basically the Ottomans wanted to put forth this argument that fighting against the Safavids was a form of legitimate religious jihad and not a political conflict because then you can motivate your you can motivate your subjects you can motivate subjects in your empire to then fight because now there's a religious cause instead of simply a political one and so ibn abidin in the 19th century he sheds light on this and he says this is what where things went wrong essentially and so then he calls for returning back to the early hanafi doctrine um and then as you were just mentioning ibn Taymiyyah, we what's so interesting about ibn Taymiyyah's view is even sometimes you know, the response I'll get from some individuals is that, well, Ibn Taymiyyah's view is legitimate too. And I'll tell them, well, let's understand the context within which his view developed. He was 29. He, um, this was the first text he wrote and he actually wrote it in a very specific context. Um, there was a, quite a bit of rioting going on and there was actually, because of a specific instance, a specific case of Sabah Rasul that emerged from a small village outside of the city of Damascus. And there was already, kind of friction with relationships between the Bedouin, between different religious groups in the Levant during this time. Um, the vicegerent in Damascus, his goal was to quell this violence. Yeah. Um, and he essentially, you know, he brought forth the individuals involved in this case. 
And his goal was just to let things go. And so he basically, for a period of time, he imprisoned the person that was accused, but he let yeah, him go. You're talking maybe about the case of uh, Asaf al-Nasrani, yes, a Christian yes, cleric, yes. who was accused yeah. of uh, insulting Prophet Muhammad. Yes, and, and, and the vice chair, and it's really clear, the vice chair, his, his biggest concern is how do I calm things down? Exactly. So he actually, he, 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 per, he, he arrests Asaf, but the chronicles indicate actually that it was almost more to protect him from all the public violence that was going on. And the vice chair also arrests Ibn Taymiyyah <laughs> because oh. he says, Ibn Taymiyyah, you are... In, you are contributing to inciting this violence. He was inciting the, the conflict between uh, Christians yes. and Muslims in Syria. Right, and so what ends up happening is the vice jurant actually brings, he creates, you know, he he calls upon the four, the, the jurists and judges from the form of that, he has a council, and they basically say, we can't penalize this man for anything, you know, mm -hmm. and they let him go, and he keeps Ibn Taymiyyah in prison. Ibn Taymiyyah is really upset about this, and it's in prison that he writes this book, saying basically why they were wrong. And so you can so you can see if, on two levels. One is I'm not you know I I'm hesitant to say a piece is emotional. I I want to attribute intellectual integrity to a piece, but we have to understand the context within which this piece was written. First of all, but second of all, he was the outsider. <laughs> yeah, he was not. The institution did not adopt his view. The other jurists who were who were actually considered authoritative in their schools. This was a multi, this was all four Sunni madhabs were, were, were consulted. None of them adopted his view. Um, the Christian was let go and Ibn Taymiyyah was upset about it. And later on, and, he converted to Islam if we talk about uh, Asaf al Nasrani. He, he yes. later became Muslim. He did, he did. And so, um, so this is where. I think that when when we, when I see Ibn Taymiyyah's text on sub cited over and over and over again in modern discourses, it's very disturbing to me because these are often jurists who are citing his text. I don't fault the the common educated individual who doesn't know Islamic law because how would they know the difference? The my 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 big worry is that you know contemporary jurists will cite his text as if it is equal to or weightier than the other texts, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other legal texts we have from the mainstream Sunni schools, not realizing that he was outside of the norm of what was going on during that time. He was the, he was kind of the, what is it called? He was going against the flow. <laughs> he was not mm. representative of orthodoxy. Well, this is how he ended up, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and and because people don't know that context, they 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 open his books and they read it and they just view it as equally authoritative. And the other interesting thing is, um, there's actually an author, an academic, his name is Muhammad Khalil, and he's written a book as well on um, theological views of some of, of of Ibn Taymiyyah and some others. And he actually says that, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah changed a lot of his views before he passed away. Like later on in life, he changed his views about a lot of these things and. And that is also something that's often not taken into account um, by jurists. And and this juridical problem of not uh, not taking into account social context, this is not just an Islamic legal interpretive issue. This happens across legal systems. Even in American law, you'll find lawyers and judges who don't take into account the social context within which a law was promulgated or a law was kind of brought forth. And they'll cite it and not thinking about, OK, well, was this something that was actually considered a norm is this something that's actually in the spirit of our legal system in general, um, and and so it's a problem across the board in the field of jurisprudence, um, and that's where for me kind of one of the interventions I make in my dissertation is this is that even as legal you know those of us who study law those of us who those who practice law we have to take social history seriously. We have to understand the context in which these things occur so that we can better understand like which view is authoritative, which view is not authoritative. You know, um, that that's something that's very much overlooked. And it's it's something that we really have to really think about. And it, and it brings us then to the modern conversation of where where is this emphasis on Ibn Taymiyyah's view coming from? Like, why why is there this emphasis? And one is there's a general you know, in the 18th, you know, specifically during colonialism, you know, this is a, I'm, I'm literally taking semesters and semesters of coursework and summarizing into one sentence. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. But, yeah. you know, on the one hand, there's this general disconnect you find between that pre-modern medieval tradition and the modern period in terms of 
you know, this ability to transmit. Um, so broken institutions, right? And then on another level, there's this issue of a lack of literacy and education, even amongst jurists of what I just mentioned about social context and social history, but also there's political motivations here as well, whether they're conscious or not. In these culture wars between like the West and Muslim countries, oftentimes Muslim countries will feel this need to kind of, you know, articulate or, or create their space and push push against whatever a specific Western policy is. And that's understandable. But then what happens is religious discourse becomes co-opted into that. And then religious discourse is misrepresented. And so we see this in family law. We see this in, con in conversations about, for, uh, about family planning and birth control and abortion, for example. Um, in Pakistan, for example, it's very common for many jurists to say that, oh, well, birth control is not permitted. And why are they saying that? They're saying that because a lot of family planning initiatives in these, you know, in in those in that region of the world are often sponsored by, you know, countries that they consider to be encroaching culturally. So then they'll take the opposing view and they'll say, well, no, you can't use birth control. But then you look historically, you know, with from an Islam, you know, in terms of Islamic texts, and you know, family planning as a concept was not considered controversial at all. Um, abortion, at least in the Hanafi school for the first, um, I'm pretty, you know, for the first trimester, I want to say, was mm -hmm. not considered an issue at all. And so do you see how like it's, it's modern politics that sometimes kind of creates a situation where ulama will take a view that's actually not reflective of our history. And I think that's the same case with Sabah Rasul. Um, it's an issue that, you know, Muslim countries can sometimes coalesce around as an identity politics thing. And I'm not saying there aren't problems on a global level when it comes to the, you know, when it comes to these, yes. you know, post-colonial, when it comes to the post-colonial context, but, um, and then you, you result in these very kind of misrepresentative views like, oh, execution for blasphemy, you know, like that's not representative of how things happened in the medieval context. There were periods of time when it did occur and it largely correlated with you know, political regimes taking advantage of sub, like the Ottomans did, um, as a means of kind of penalizing specific individuals that they deemed rebels, but mainstream jurists did not ordinarily practice this. Um, and it's, I think it's important for, you know, for everyone to know that. Uh, we, we should know that behind any kind of extremism and uh, bigotry, stays uh, ignorance and uh, sometimes uh, mental illness because in the way they interpret uh, very complex uh, topics is is completely wrong and uh, it's caused by ignorance ignorance yes, and yes. Uh, and uh, Ignorance and uh, ardent approach. They're, they're too ardent and too ignorant at the same time, and it's a bad combination. If you have yes, ignorance, there, there's a, yes, absolutely, no, I agree with you. There's there's an issue of ignorance on multiple levels. There's also an issue of a serious lack of literacy in our yeah. tradition, and. Um, and then there's this issue of a lack of awareness of how much politics plays a role in which opinions have become, have come to dominate. And on the lay level, when I speak to Muslims who are not involved in jur you know jurisprudential discourse, for example, they won't they don't always realize how much what they're learning is a product of, let's say, for example, Middle Eastern or South, South Asian states who have very much conditioned Islamic curriculums or Islamic studies curriculums to to kind of take to adopt certain views that correlate with what they want the masses to learn, right? And so oftentimes the lay populations, whether it's in the West or you know in, in Western countries or yeah. in the Muslim world, they'll um, they'll be they're they're completely not literate and not aware of how the hudud um, discourse actually functions in Islamic law, um, and and they don't realize that okay, well the books you're reading. Those books have largely been edited or have been certain yeah, parts exactly. of the censor, you know, and I even remember when I was doing my research, you know, I have the physical books that I use. And then there is actually a database called uh, a Shamila, 
and it's a digitized, you know, it's basically a database that has digitized books, thousands and thousands of books. And I was so surprised because when I would look up some of the books for which I had physical copies, there were entire chapters that were deleted. <laughs> and that's when I realized I was like, okay, you know, these, these chapters dealing with public law, um, are considered threatening in some Muslim countries and they mm. will entirely they will delete these chapters and and then republish the book. And so then people reading them don't even realize that there's missing chapters in them. Um, mm. And then that gives the state kind of almost complete authority to say what they want to say um, in some contexts. And so, you know, there's that element. And then also with, you know, with, with there's also this issue of, I remember my committee I remember discussing with, with with my committee, but reading Ibn Abidin's text is much harder than reading Ibn Taymiyyah's text. Ibn Taymiyyah, when he wrote his text, that one of the things that made it very different from regular mainstream juridical work is he was not actually speaking to other jurists, which is what a juridical text normally does. Yeah. He decided he was going to speak to the masses and he was going to speak to public authorities in his text. And so the way you know the way he speaks about it is much more legible and understandable. And I think sometimes in a modern context, when lay Muslims are reading uh, um, works, you, because of, because of our sense of, you know, actually with the increase in education, so, you know, like not religious education, but other areas of education and literacy, we often have this sense of confidence of, okay, well, I, I should be able to read a text and understand it. And if something, if there's something there that I don't understand, then it must not be correct or it must not be worth reading. And so what often happens is Ibn Taymiyyah's texts are actually much easier to read yeah. than the Orthodox stuff. And so then people will gravitate towards that because it makes sense. You know, it, they read it and they're like, okay, well, like I, I can read this and understand it. And so there's a huge problem in that context as well of realizing that no, you know, Islamic law developed into a specific, it was a profession. Of there course. was a certain, you know, vocabulary. There were certain Term, there's terminology, there's norms, and we've just lost that. No, it we've became a populist uh, theology. Yes. This is the problem. Yes. With if you put too much populism, yes. you, you're going to, to lose the essence and, and uh, you're going to make things absolutely maybe understandable and, for lay people, but at the same time inaccurate in a, in a theological 100%. sense. And, and I see this now with social media. You know, a, you know, if a, if a scholar or a jurist puts out a statement about something, they will get hounded by 500 people who disagree yeah. with them. And, yeah. you know, some scholars are able to hold, you know, kind of hold, have a backbone about it and not change their view, whereas yeah. others, they worry about it and they kind of allow what, what's often called the tail wagging the dog, yes, where they, course. you know, where they, it matters to them that what the followers think and so they you know and i, I well, they care, they care some... about they care about the reaction from lay people yes it's, it's the yes, same as, as, heard... as those who, who who run the podcast with popular topics although it's a pseudoscience and uh, all kinds of right. uh, inaccurate uh, information that they disseminate but they they're looking for followers and and likes right while it, other exactly. people who are more serious don't, right. don't care about this. They, 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 they're more interested, interested to have a niche right. and to channel be popular. For, for interaction yep. between different intellectuals. I'm going to send you the, the second link in a few seconds. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. So you started so, um, about something, please. Yes. So going back to what we were just discussing, you know, there have been individuals I've spoken to in the past who adopt this view of, you know, execution for blasphemy, you know, unilateral and no ifs, ands, or buts. And, um, you know, and I'll show them all the evidence. And then their response is not refuting the evidence because they can't. <laughs> They'll say that, well, what, what, what about all my followers? What are they going to think? You know, yeah. they're going to going to have a problem with this. And I'll tell them, well, you're you're the educator. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you're following. You're the educator. It's not about letting your followers dictate your agenda. You're the one that should be teaching them. Um, and then the other source of influence is sometimes um, specific countries will actually sponsor the publications of a specific uh, 
you know, public personalities books and things like that. And so they'll say, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to go against what Saudi says, or I don't want to go against what XYZ country says, because it will essentially ruin that relationship, that financial relationship that exists, right? And so there's all these kind of other things in the mix that I think the lay, the, the normal, you know, lay Muslim doesn't fully realize is going on um, that we have to really think about. And I'm not saying this is all, you know, a malicious, I want to be really clear, this is not some malicious giant conspiracy. It's not that. It's just, there's just, there's a, you know, we, we, we have this legacy of Islamic legal interpretation that, the, the, you know, those institutions largely don't exist anymore in isolate, you know, separate from the state, um, one. And two, we don't have the literacy of medieval Islamic law that, you know, that we used to have. And so that's what allows some of these, uh, you know, some of these views that are misrepresented of orthodoxy to dominate the discourse now. <coughs> you also started the Muslim female revivalist movement called uh, Kabasiyat. Kabasiyat yes. was, uh, I think, your thesis for, for master started. Yes. Yes. It was my thesis for my master's degree. I was yeah. curious. This, this was actually before, this was in 2007, before um, the Arab Spring happened. So, Yes, I was curious to see how, you know, what versions of female religious education are actually succeeding in certain parts of the world, particularly in Syria, which is generally speaking a little bit more of a conservative country. And what was very interesting was that the social movement, you know, there are some limitations that they have, um, which I'll discuss in, you know, secondary, you know, second, but first, you know, what's so fascinating is they've been able to forge relationships with specific contemporary traditional ulama and essentially create spaces where women can um, achieve very high levels of religious education and licensing. And so, for example, one of their students who is now, you know, who then turned into a teacher, um, I think, oh, I have to remember, I think Samira Azayed. I, oh, I, I should, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's her name, but she has written an authoritative Sira text, which is now used in um, religious institutions across the world. And so it's a very interesting way through which the, um, this specific movement by kind of supporting women's causes and women's social institutions and women's religious education specifically, they've been able to create kind of their own strain or their own line of scholars who are female and are not necessarily having to deal with those daily barriers that that one month that one may find in some other uh, religious educational institutions. Um, so there are some huge, huge accomplishments that they've made on that level. But there's also, you know, no no institution necessarily is without its flaws, right? And so their ability to exist in Syria for such a long time is also largely because they avoided discussing you know, topics considered unsafe under the Syrian regime. And of so course. they're, right? And so their, their area that they focus on are issues related to worship and prayer and those kinds of things. And so then they emphasize that in their teachings. And one problem that can happen then is oftentimes their followers will view that as being all of religion, that religion is only this type of you know it's, it's only focused on religion it's only focused on prayer and how you do your wudu and these kinds of things and and what can happen then is you you forget that religious identity is a very broad thing not every muslim prays not every muslim does these things and yet you can't call them non-muslim do you know what i mean and so being yeah. muslim yes is is prayer is prayer technically obligatory absolutely but that doesn't mean that that's the be like you know there are plenty of muslims out there that still consider themselves muslim and do good things and engage in society in positive ways and they may not necessarily adhere to you know praying exactly a specific way five times a day and we have to just kind of have that broader mindset and realize that you know everybody being you know like considering the oneself Muslim is one thing and then practicing what one practices is another. The third thing also is that there's this whole other area of Islamic law that isn't discussed, which are these issues, which we call um, the maqasid al-sharia and the khuliyat and these general larger principles or these larger kind of 
ideas in Islamic law that influence how we interpret what's important and what's not. And when it comes to that, it can sometimes, for, 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 for individuals who are not schooled in that, they sometimes then adhere to very kind of what we might call literalist views of the text and consider other views, which may be um, what they might view as less literal um, to be then somehow less authentic. And when we look at the Hanafi discourse, for example, that's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily the case, at least within the Hanafi school, that a view that might be, you know, based on Qiyas is somehow less religiously orthodox than a view that's be, you know that's 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 that you can attribute straight to a hadith and the reason for that is and we see this even with sabr rasul is that oftentimes the hadith there's there, there'll be a mixture the, the hadith are not direct and clear about anything specific because they may not about everything i'm saying with sabr rasul specifically you, you're dealing with an amalgamation of hadith that point to different you know, courses of action. There's essentially disagreement amongst those hadith. And so, you know, how do you deal with that? You know, a Hanafi trained jurist would say, well, you look at them all together and you figure out why was the prophet doing this one act in some in one instance and why was he doing this other act in another instance? And you take it all holistically. Whereas someone who isn't trained in that and is only trained in a very limited area might just look at one hadith and say that, okay, well, the prophet executed this person Therefore, everyone who commits this act is executed. Does that make sense? You know, whereas, you know, the a traditional Hanafi jurist would say, no, 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 no. He didn't execute most of the time. You know, he only executed in these two instances. And he executed because that person was creating some kind of larger harm. That's what looking at all the hadith together lets you do. But if you just are okay with like looking at one or two hadith and saying, well, I'm taking a literal interpretation. I'm somehow being more authentic to the tradition by taking a little inter literal interpretation. That's actually incorrect in most cases because is not, isn't it the case, at least the Hanafi would say, isn't it the case that taking all the hadith together and coming up with a view, isn't that some, you know, isn't that actually more reflective of a kind of an authentic process in lieu of kind of picking and choosing one hadith over another? That's what they would argue. So that's kind of the harm that comes with some of the religious training that you find in some countries, like Syria, for example. In some cases, you'll see that all that additional training is excluded. And the training that someone is 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 exposed to is just this very limited, almost like literalist, uh, you know, you learn how to read hadith, you learn how to read tafsir, tafsir from the Quran, and you don't learn that advanced Islamic legal interpretive corpus, you know? And so then you come up with these very basic kind of interpretations that don't actually reflect the tradition, but the person engaging in these interpretations doesn't even realize they're doing something wrong because they were trained in the first place. Does that make sense? And, and it's because of the way the state, this you know, whether it's in Syria or whether it's in other countries, the way that they have kind of deleted certain aspects of the Islamic tradition and the training that comes with it. And it's that awareness that I think a lot of Muslims don't have. They don't realize that, okay, well, the state is editing, is curating, is deleting. Um, and so the version of a book we're getting is not the original version in which, you know, it's it's not, it's not, the original version of the book, one, and two, we're not getting the context, we're not getting the entire tradition around that book and what role that book played. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And I, I have a question for you. What's the state of uh, Islam in 2023 within the U.S.? Are these divisions and different uh, interpretations of uh, Islamic tradition uh, present in within the the u.s muslims like in in our part of the world or it's a bit different um it, i think yeah. it's variable in the sense of i think we're yeah. at the stage right now where you know you have specific individuals who are going who are just who are choosing to go back to the middle east or choosing to go back to south asia and study and what often happens is they'll come back and there's a very there's a varying way that this transfer ideas of a transfer of ideas happens. On one level, you'll have some that go, you'll have some individuals that do take the time to engage in the training system entirely and also learn the social history, learn the history, you know, historical side of things. Yeah. And they're trying to do what they can to promulgate that side of the tradition. But on the other hand, unfortunately, there's those who do go abroad come back and only have that specific kind of cut and paste approach, whether they realize it or not. And so they bring those ideas back to the U.S. And in the U.S., the problem that we have is 
there's no standard to, there's no measuring stick mm. to determine what level of training someone has. And so someone who has a little bit of training versus a lot of training, oftentimes the community will consider both people to be sheikhs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your sheikh and your sheikh. Yeah. <laughs> and so they don't realize, well, one person took classes that were considered like basically da'wah da'wa classes sponsored by the state of, you know, the, by the by the United Arab Emirates or by Syria or whatever state yeah. that they went to. And well, as another one, maybe spent 10 or 15 years studying with a variety of teachers, studying under a variety of trained um, jurists and judges. And, you know, and, and the normal community members are unable to distinguish between those two and will often, you know, gravitate towards the person that, you know, either communicates their ideas in a more effective way or somehow resonates with the community. And then this is the second problem. And I don't have a solution to this. I don't know. Is that, you know, religious institutions in the United States, um, whereas in the Muslim world right now, the problem we have is that religious institutions tend to be funded by the state and that creates its own problematic dynamic. In the U.S., they are funded by the communities themselves. So the community hires and fires the imam. <laughs> yeah. That creates a problem, too. It is a problem, it's the tail, Yeah, because it's the tail wagging the dog problem where, you know, one issue, my husband deals with this all the time because he's an attorney and he deals with marriages and divorces and things like that. Yeah. And what he'll tell me is that, you know, sometimes someone will come to him and say, well, you know, what is the Islamic view on X, Y, or Z? And why is my imam, use, you know, what, what my imam is saying is, is, is what he's saying actually reflective of the tradition. And my husband will inform them that actually, no, you can get divorced in this and this and this and this situation. And you don't have a limit in these, you know, X, Y, Z situation. And, and what he'll come to find is the imam, because maybe that person's husband is on the board or, you know, the imam is not feeling available you know he's not feeling like he can freely you know state what his view is because if yeah. he were to do that then he would get fired or he alienated or, or he's going to be alienated from his uh alienated his congregation. from his so community he's lot, they're trying, yeah, they're trying he's, to compromise with with layman and the community right Right. And, and, and it's, it's, I've, and it's, it's very often been the case that an imam gets fired for saying, or gets, you know, in trouble for saying something, which, you know, whether it's the board leadership or the community, it doesn't resonate with them. Um, a very common problem is, you know, when young people are looking to get married, um, sometimes the imam will say, oh, well, you need to, you, like, let me, let me start over. So when young people are looking to get married, technically you don't, for a young Muslim man to get married, he doesn't need the permission of his parents. Um, he can move forward with someone as he wishes, so long as everything is handled appropriately. No. And that's, you know, but if your parents are the ones donating, if, the par if your parents are the ones involved in the masjid, the imam will be very hesitant to say, okay, yes, you can marry so-and-so. You know, he will maybe say, oh, no, 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 you actually need to involve your parents in the process. You need to, you know, you need to, and I'm not saying that's not better to do. It's great if no. parents and you know, families get along, but that's not always possible. And then if it's not always possible, are you going to deny someone the ability to get married religiously just because their parents are not on board, you know? And so that's where a lot of these little fuzzy issues come into play where the imam will say, oh, no, no, well, you should maybe, you should have your parents, you should take your parents, you know, advice into consideration. They should really be part of the process. It's a marriage between families, like that whole discourse. And so there's this, as you said, there's this balancing act that happens between this role that they play of giving religious advice and then this other role that they have of being an employee of a group of people <laughs> and and there being the very very real fear that they could get fired for saying something like oh no you don't actually need your parents permission to get married you can get married on your own um so that's the big challenge is this tail wagging the dog problem in the united states and i don't I'm not, you know, I I see the problem and I'm not entirely sure yet what the solution is. I think, I mean, right now there's two solutions, not solutions, but there's two avenues that seem to um, have promise. One is, you know, there are a certain strain of jurists who have also been able to procure academic positions in academia. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't come with its challenges, of course, because you have to then cater your research agenda towards what academia wants from you of course but there is this element of being able to step away from the community and not be at the behest of the community you can write something and not be worried that 
the religious community is going to be able to have an effect on your job. Um, so that's really important. And then another avenue is creating basically endowed institutions which are running off of kind of endowed donations and funds where you can appoint jurists and scholars who essentially almost like a think tank where their job is to yeah. produce religious scholarship, but they're not necessarily, at least on a daily basis at the behest of the community that's hiring them. What's the perception of organizations like uh, the Nation of Islam amongst uh, American Muslims, for instance? Amongst the, what was, amongst who? Amongst American Muslims. How they perceive them? Uh, do they take them seriously or? Uh, That's a really interesting question. I think there's a mix, right? Like yeah. the Nation of Islam has, un has gone through a very transformative history where actually a lot of their former temples have turned into mainstream Muslim Orthodox masjids. And yeah. there's definitely a very real problem of integration between immigrant, largely dominant immigrant communities and African-American communities. And I'd say the problem is more on the side of the immigrant communities, the South Asian and, you know, and Arab masjids typically kind of, I think there's two problems that a lot of academics would point to. One is this sense of, you know, religious leadership, of course, should come from the Middle East. There's this idea. And so mm -hmm. then an imam who is graduated from Al-Azhar is, or is of Middle Eastern descent, you know, there's a sense of like, well, he, of course, is more authoritative than an African-American imam, yeah. right? So there's that element. And then there's also just this um, religious institutions are not only about religion, they're also about race and class, exactly. unfortunately, unfortunately, right? And so, exactly. you know, and so what will often happen is, you know, and I know this is the case, you know, in some of the major cities is that, you know, the suburban wealthy masjids are also dominated by immigrant populations who are, you know, highly educated and, um, you know, and have a very specific understanding of Islam and are not really necessarily looking to expand that, their scope of it. Whereas a lot of African American masjids may even, you know, they may be in urban areas, they're dealing with very real urban issues. And so the agendas of what needs to be, you know, what the day to day agendas are very different. And this is where I do, you know, some may consider me a little harsh for this, but I do put the onus on the immigrant um, suburban masjids to reach out, because they tend to be very um, high in resources, high in yeah. finances, and, and can really do a lot more than they currently are. Um, and they're, they can actually do more in recognizing and realizing the fact that, like, you know, race has no correlation with religious authenticity. No, you know? absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, and, and so it, this is, I'm, I'm actually glad you, I'm really glad you brought this up because this is a very real problem right now. Um, As I said, ignorant, ignorant people, ignorant people connect Christianity right. with racism or Islam with racism or even Judaism right. has nothing to do with the, uh, with the race. Right, right. These are right. monotheistic, uh, universal uh, teachings, and they they should not they shouldn't uh, know about these boundaries like ethnicity or, or or race. Right, and and so part of it is you know bringing to awareness, you know bringing those communities to awareness of what what exactly they're doing when they're constructing a mosque that ends up being largely South Asian or largely Arab. Like, you know, you're creating a specific artificial environment that isn't actually reflective of what your religious teachings are telling you. Yeah. And so that's a very slow process though. There are some communities that have made a lot of progress on that level. And then there's some communities that, you know, there's still a very long way to go. Um, and so that's that's a very real challenge right now. Um, and that we're, you know, we're still actively working on it. A very interesting author who's read, who's written a lot about this is Sherman Jackson. He's a professor at the University of Southern California. He is a, you know, outwardly self-professing like Muslim. Um, he considers himself part of the community Sunni Muslim, but he also, you know, is very aware of these kind of race specific issues and how Islam resonates differently in different communities and has written a lot about it in a very thoughtful kind of way. Um, and I've learned a lot from his work and it really informs, uh, you know, the way I also approach, uh, my own work, but also the way I communicate with different groups and populations and things like that. Do you want to add something else? Um, no, I, I think this has been, it's always wonderful having a conversation with you. I, I have, I really enjoy the opportunities that I have to speak with you because you're so, 
um, you're so knowledgeable and 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 well versed in you know a lot of the issues that are going on in in religious and political spaces nowadays. And so it's it's always a joy having conversations with you. Um, do you have any questions for me? No, I would I would uh, close at this point, and we're going to continue in coming weeks. Of course, when you're available and uh, also it was a very oh, hectic oh. period it's it's been a hectic period for me and uh, it's all related to the royal wedding that we expect next yes. thursday but also there were many seminars and uh, conferences that i attended so i think until maybe august i'm going to have enough material for maybe 15, 20 articles. I'll try to That's go right, for, right. for more, but uh, at this moment, uh, I already have 15, 15 texts for the JT. Of course, there are other, other media that uh, collaborate with me. They didn't uh, get rid of myself yet, but we'll see. Yeah. It, it, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And we're going yeah, to yeah, it's definitely we're pleasure. going to continue with with this conversation because problems that uh, Muslims face in Europe or in the Middle East or in a in 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 southeastern Asia probably have their repercussions in in the states when all these communities gather and they they bring with with, with themselves uh, all kinds of right. uh, doubts and. Uh, controversies. Yes, I completely agree. And it's we're to, talking about maybe know. four or five million pe people in the States. How many Muslims live, live in the States? That's I a think, good, I think that's a good estimate. It's it's every institution provides a different estimate, but I think the yeah. ballpark you're mentioning is pretty, it's probably somewhere around there. Um, yeah, and, you know, there's a, yeah. and so um, so it's definitely a significant population and an influential one. And depending on what me metropolitan space you're in, what, you know, the Twin Cities, for example, um, mm. there's quite a concentration of Muslims that live within Minneapolis. And so they actually have quite a strong impact on politics here, um, for example. Same with Detroit. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of aspects, there's a lot of elements, but but yes, it's been wonderful to speak with you and and to talk with you. And yes, definitely let me know in August if you want to speak again. Um, I'm happy to do so. I think we can speak before August, unless you're busy. Okay. No, so it's we'll fine. Keep in yeah. touch. Okay. Take care. All the best. God bless. Bye. Bye.